Hi, welcome. So today we are here to talk about bestiary or in Spanish bestiario, which was the first short story collection by the Argentinian writer Julio Cortázar. This collection is from 1951. I read it in Spanish, but all the stories have been translated into English. I'm not sure who the translator is or even if all the stories in the collection are translated by the same person. I researched it online, couldn't really find any information about this. I'm sorry about that. If you go to the description box, you will find links to all the different versions of this book in English and in Spanish and also any other book that I mentioned during the video. If you click on those links and buy the books, I will get a small commission. It will not cost you any extra, but I will get a small commission. So that's a nice way for you to support my channel so I can keep making video reviews for you. Okay, so who is Julio Cortázar? Well, Julio Cortázar is simply one of the most important Latin American writers from the 20th century. And he's also one of the best and most influential writers from Argentina, second only to Jorge Luis Borges. If you're a regular viewer, you'll probably know that I love Jorge Luis Borges, but I also love Julio Cortázar. This month, I read his first collection of short stories, The Bestiary, Bestiario. So I'm going to talk about each of the stories in that collection. There are eight stories in total. The title of the first story in Spanish is Casa Tomada or in English House Taking Over. Now this story is my favorite from this collection and it is also one of the best short stories I have ever read. It is also the kind of story that is deceptively easy to read. So you think, oh, this is very straightforward, this is very easy, but then it isn't that easy and it definitely isn't that straightforward. And that is something that is common to many of the stories in this collection. I'm just going to come out and say it right now. If you are only going to read one story from this collection or just one story by Julio Cortázar, this a house taking over is the one I would recommend. Although I also have the feeling that if you read Casa Tomada, you probably will not want to stop at that and might want to read the whole collection. So like many of the stories in this book, House Taking Over begins as a realistic story and then gradually becomes fantastical. So at first, you feel like you're reading something very straightforward, you know, a straightforward story that takes place or could take place in the real world. But then fantastical elements are introduced, they begin to creep in, and those elements are going to defy your experience of the real world and will also make you start wondering about what you're reading. And then you will realize that what you're reading is different from what you expected when you started the short story. I'm going to talk about the plot of House Taking Over now. I'm going to do that about all the stories in this collection, but I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm just going to give you the bare bones of the stories, just the setup. I'm not going to tell you what happens or how they end, just the mere uh, set up for each one of them. So this one, House Taken Over, well it is the story of two siblings named Irene and well an unnamed narrator really. He's the other protagonist of the story. He's Irene's brother. They both live together in an old colonial style house in Buenos Aires. We learn that the siblings have always lived in that house and that they barely go outside in fact, they seem to have devoted their whole lives to that big house to the extent that they never even got married, they never uh, formed their own families, they stayed together, the two siblings stayed together in that big house and took care of it. Their feelings about the house are very strange, uh, although, you know, I'm sure a lot of people feel like that about their homes or about other things in their life. Both siblings are horrified by the mere thought that anybody else could live in that house one day, even one of their relatives, once they die. What happens is that one day, the siblings began to hear strange noises 
coming from the back of the house, from the rooms at the back of the house, and they think that intruders have taken over parts of the house. So what do the two siblings do? They kind of stay where they are, they retreat, they never go to those areas that they think have been taken over by intruders. So they stay in the parts of the house that have not been taken over yet, and that's how they live. But gradually, that area reserved to themselves becomes smaller and smaller. We as readers never see the intruders, we never hear from them. The siblings themselves never hear them speak. Um, they just hear strange noises and um, something like whispers, but nothing that could have any meaning at all. One of the things I like about this story is that it's rich in description. At first, we get a detailed description of the house itself, but also we get to know the two siblings pretty well. So the narrator, the brother, is an extremely educated man and a connoisseur of French literature. So even though this story is set in Argentina, in Buenos Aires uh, specifically, the narrator seems to be more interested in French culture than in the culture, in the culture of his own country, and I think this is significant. I think in short stories, every little detail is significant. Then his sister Irene is an even more passive character because she spends most of her days knitting, just like Homer's Penelope. Irene seems to be waiting for something, but we just don't know what. If you remember, in the Odyssey, Penelope is waiting for her husband Ulysses to come back from the war, but what is Irene waiting for here? Something that is great about this story is that there could be all kinds of interpretations, and in fact, many different kinds of interpretations exist and have been explored about this story. There is even a political interpretation that sees the house taking over as the country taking over by Peronism in the 1940s and 50s. I just love this story from beginning to end. Then the second story is entitled Carta a una señorita en París, which in English translates as letter to a young lady in Paris. Now, this story is completely different, and that is one of the strengths of this collection, that even though you can see some similarities between some of the stories, they are all quite different, and that is because they were written at different stages of his development as a writer. Once again, we have a male narrator, but the narrator of this story is very peculiar, to say the least. When you read the story, it seems like the narrator is a pretty normal person. There's only something weird that happens to him that makes him different, and that is the fact that he throws up little bunnies. Yeah, you heard that right. I'm not gonna go into that because it's a bit disgusting, but the bunnies are really cute. And I don't know if that happens when he's stressing out or what, but it's something that happens. Apparently, that wouldn't be much of a problem for him, except for one fact. And that fact is that the narrator is staying at an apartment that doesn't belong to him, it belongs to a girl named André. Now, André is now spending some time in Paris, so the narrator is meant to live in the apartment, take care of it, while she is in France. So what the story is, how the story is structured, is as a long letter. And in that long letter, the narrator explains to his friend André about the bunnies that have now invaded her apartment, and how he's planning to get rid of them. And that's the plot of this story without any spoilers. I guess that letter to a young lady in Paris is a confession, uh, because things get out of hand and he just doesn't really know how to deal with the bunnies. And he feels very guilty about them, because bunnies, as you probably know, are not meant to live in apartments, so they make a mess of everything. There are several of them, many of them, and they break her stuff, and he feels very guilty about it, and that's why he's writing a letter to her. So weird, but let's move on to the third story, which is entitled Lejana, or in English, The Distances. Now, this story reminds me a little bit, actually a lot, about Borges, because I think, you know, Borges and Cortázar are very different writers. Overall, and this is a very subjective, very personal thing, but I think I prefer Borges. But having said that, there are some stories by Cortázar that I just love, and this is one of them. So, the protagonist in this story is a woman. Her name is Alina Reyes. She lives in Buenos Aires and keeps a diary. So that's kind of what we're reading here. What's so special or 
strange about Alina Reyes? Well, she is prone to fantasize and has a very vivid imagination and she also has premonitions. So one thing that is recurrent in her premonitions or in her fantasies or thoughts is the image of a homeless woman who lives in Budapest of all places. Of course, Alina has never met this homeless woman, so we don't know if she is just something that Alina has created in her own mind or if she is indeed having a premonition. So in this story, Alina gets married and then she asks her husband to take her to Budapest because she wants to meet this woman. And of course, I'm not going to tell you what happens after that because as I promised you at the beginning, no spoilers. I just want to encourage you to read these stories. I don't want to spoil them for you. I want you to, after watching this video, go back and read them and tell me what you think about them. Okay, so once again, this story seems to be realistic and straightforward up to a point because then there are some fantastical elements that are thrown in that transport us to another world. But, and this is important to say, this is not magical realism. Make no mistake, Cortázar wasn't interested in magical realism. Magical realism is not what he does. What he does is something completely different. I don't think there is a term for it. He just uses elements from fantasy and horror. I think that's what it is, but it's not magical realism at all. He just gets you hooked with realism and then introduces fantastical elements, but a lot of horror movies do that. So it is not magical realism. I also wouldn't say that it's straight fantasy or straight horror, but it has elements of those. Okay, the next story is Omnibus, or in English, Omnibus. <laughs> this is one of the, I would say, most subtle stories in this collection. In it, a girl is riding the bus that goes to a cemetery, although I don't think that's where she's meant to go. That's just the end of the line and she just happens to be on that bus. This story is incredibly simple. So because the end of the line is a cemetery, all the passengers riding the bus have flowers with them because they're going to the cemetery. So they're all carrying flowers. And she is the only passenger who doesn't have any flowers with her. And that is why the driver and all the other passengers are hostile to her. They judge her very negatively. So she feels terrible, but that's only until a young man who's also not carrying flowers boards the bus at some point. Now, this story develops their brief but intense link that is established between these two people, these two young people, and that only really lasts the length of the bus ride, which is the length of the story. Cephalea or in English, Headache, is the next story in the collection. And I would say that it is one of the most fantastical stories in the collection. And I say that because it includes animals that don't even exist in real life. So Julio Cortázar made up some animals and puts them at the center of this story. The animals are called mancuspias in Spanish. Now, I'm not sure how that would have been translated into English because it's a made-up word and I haven't read the, the English translation of this short story, so I don't know. But my feeling is that they are probably just called mancuspias in English as well. So this story is said at a farm where this weird animal, the mancuspias, live. On this farm, these weird animals, the mancuspias, are kept in cages. The problem is that the people who look after them begin to get strangely ill. So the animals begin to make them sick. And the main symptom of this sickness that they get from the animals is headaches, hence the title of the story. All the stories in this collection have one thing in common. They are all disturbing. You've probably worked that out already. But this one might be the story that disturbed me the most. The next story is really not any less disturbing. It is entitled Circe, same title in English and in Spanish, obviously. The story is, of course, based on Greek mythology and the goddess Circe. Now, just to just in case you're not au fait with Greek mythology, Circe is the goddess that turns men into pigs in the Odyssey. But this story is not said in mythical times. The story is said in Argentina, and it doesn't really feature any Greek gods or goddesses. At the center of this story, we have a single woman named Delia Mañara. Okay, so what's so special about Delia Mañara or what's weird about it? Because, you know, whenever you get a main character 
in Julio Cortázar, you start wondering what's wrong with them, what's special about them, what's fantastical, what's magical, what's scary about them. Well, there is something about Delia Mañara. The thing is that uh, she has been engaged to be married twice before, so she has had two fiancés in the past, and both of them died violently. The first one has a bad fall, and the second one kills himself. But this all happens before the story begins, so I'm not spoiling anything. Because the story is not about those two fiancés, the story is about another man who comes into Delia's life later. His name is Mario, and he's the protagonist and narrator of this story. Despite Delia's past, or maybe because of it, he falls in love with her, and from that moment on, we wonder what will happen to him, given what we know about Delia's past. The best way to find out is to read the story. Okay, next we have Las Puertas del Cielo, or in English, The Gates of Heaven. Mm, this story is probably my least favorite in the collection. I don't even like the title. This story deals with mourning, and it begins when a man finds out that his wife has died from tuberculosis. And in this story, he struggles with memories of her, as one of his friends uh, tries to cheer him up by taking him out dancing. That's really the plot of the story, although it has a fantastical ending that I will not discuss in this video. And the final story is Bestiario, or Bestiary itself. So the final story in the book is the one that shares its title with the whole collection. And I would say that like the other two previous stories, Headache and Letter to a Young Lady in Paris, animals, or well, one animal in particular, plays a big role in this story. In this case, the animal is a tiger, and this tiger is key to the story. So, Bestiary is set in a big country house, a big house where a teenager named Isabel is spending the summer, okay? That's normal, but what's wrong with Isabel, or what's wrong with the farm, or what's wrong with the tiger, that's probably what you wonder. Well, you don't know about the tiger first, it's just a big house. What's strange, what's unusual about this house is that the foreman keeps a tiger on the property, as you do. So there is this constant, ominous thread of the tiger running through the whole story. You kind of wonder, will the tiger attack Isabel or any of the other characters in the story at some point? I love that ominousness, which is also something that many of the stories in the collection share. There is often some internal or external thread. Actually, Oftentimes, it is something that is quite close to us, well, quite close to the characters, often in the same house or on the same property that could kill them or chase them away. You know, that happens in many of the stories. In this case, that thing is a tiger. The threat is not supernatural, it's not mysterious, something very real, very plausible even. But the point is that this tiger and the other elements in the other stories that are a thread, an ominous thread, are things that we cannot control, or the characters cannot control, and there are elements that don't necessarily follow logic. So a tiger doesn't follow logic, a tiger doesn't act fairly or unfairly, he acts, or it acts, by instinct. I think I would recommend Cortázar and this short story collection to everyone who has not read his work yet, and although this might be a bit of a cliché, I would recommend Cortázar especially to younger readers. Not children, of course, but younger readers. I think that some of the stories, some of his stories in this collection and in other collections, are great to read when you're a teenager or a young adult. But something about Cortázar that is different to Borges is that, unlike Borges, Cortázar also wrote novels. And his most famous novel is Hopscotch. I own this big um, Spanish language edition. Now, this novel, it's interesting as well, I would also recommend it. There are two ways of reading this novel. There is one straightforward way, and then there is a hopscotch way. I have only so far read it in the straightforward way, and that was, I think, a couple of years ago. But when I read it again, I will play the game, I will play hopscotch as Cortázar intended his readers to do, and I will make a review 
here on this channel about this novel. So let me know also if you would like me to review more short story collections or novels by Cortázar apart from the best. So I have reviewed The Best You Read today and I will review Hopscotch at some point in the future. Cannot tell you exactly when, but I will. So I would like to ask you now to let me know in the comment section below if you would like me to review other novels by Cortázar or more of his short story collections. I will see you again very soon, I hope. Take care.